Look out, everybody. Zach Kortz here with RevZilla, and we're back with another episode of Daily Rider. You know the drill. This is the show where we learn about motorcycles as we ride. Our guest on this program is the Desert X from Ducati, which is very exciting. Not for the standard issue engine at the middle of it, but the rest of the bike, right? We got a 21 inch front wheel, we got long travel suspension, and we've got retro Dakar rally styling looks. It's got a it's got a whiff of the desert about it, doesn't it? Wow. So an obvious question rears its head then. How does the Ducati pedigree for performance translate to the world of true adventure? The answer to that question and more coming right up. All right, everybody, Ducati Desert X. Before we get going, a friendly reminder, this episode of Daily Rider is brought to you by Michelin. Michelin has won more than 100 off-road world championships since the early 1980s, from the Dakar Rally to World Enduro to Outdoor Trials, and they continue to outfit some of the best teams on the planet. More to the point, Michelin is a fan of Daily Rider, so the next time you need tires for your street bike, your dirt bike, your Dakar Rally adventure bike, Uh, click on the link in the description of this video. Shop Michelin products, and you too will be supporting Daily Rider. Alrighty. So this Desert X has got some nifty kit, especially for a Ducati, right? A big 21-inch front wheel, as I mentioned. Brembo calipers, braided lines, which is typical Ducati stuff. The wheels are a cross-spoke tubeless, which, of course, is all the rage in the luxury adventure market. And they're quite nice, I think. The engine, standard issue, as I said, this is the 937cc 90-degree uh, V-twin. Same engine from uh, Hypermotard, Multishot V2. Uh, what else? Monster. Um, so it's a it's a widely used engine in the Ducati lineup, but I think it works pretty well in this state. And we'll talk about how and why a little bit later on. You get kind of a flat seat, and uh, yeah, it's just sort of like tall and burly and adventurous, right? Now this bike does have some kit on it that is not standard. Expanded hand guards with an aluminum piece in there, which is kind of nice, and crash bars. The little mesh across the radiator, uh, a bigger skid plate, all of the tidbits. Oh, and there's some heated grips as well. Yeah. So all the tidbits add 1500 or two grand to the price, something like that, which bring it up to about 19 and a half thousand. This Termignoni muffler is very nice. I think we can agree. It's also quite pricey. I think it's about two grand just for the muffler. So as it sits, the bike is around 22,000 bucks, something like that which will be a topic of conversation because as a mid-size ADV, that's a pretty spicy meatball, you might say. And of course, there's a whole discussion around that that you can have about how the Multishot V4 is, you know, 27 or 32, depending on if you get the rally and whatever. So 20 grand for this bike, uh, 18 grand, whatever, is, um, you know, mid-size. And uh, fair enough. I don't make those rules. I just test the bikes and tell you how they work. Speaking of which... Uh, We can fire up this 5-inch TFT that's set vertically, very adventuresome, Um, and we'll dive into more of how all of this works a little bit later on. For now, we can fire the bad boy up. Got a bit of a, got some energy, right? Got a bit of a clatter, a bit of a, let's go fight, which I kind of like. It's the old, uh, Twin headlights, which I think look totally wicked, personally. All right, that's enough talking about bikes, right? Let's uh, let's go talk about how it works, and I can tell you how I got all that dust on the back wheel. That kind of thing. All righty. Let's get our urban adventure on, shall we? We are off. Okie doke, as for specs, uh, we just did a quick rundown of pricing, (laughs) so I won't go any further into that. But the engine, 937cc engine that I mentioned, 110 claimed horsepower and I believe 68 foot-pounds of torque, something like that. Friendly reminder that the specs for uh, engine performance and all the other specs that I list are in the description of the video if you want to look them up. As for the rest of the specs, you've got 5.4 gallons of guzzling in the tank, which is um, a pretty sizable gas tank, good for an adventurous bike. And that means that the Desert X tipped the scales 
at Revzilla West at 517 pounds, which is mm, not a particularly small motorcycle and not a particularly small motorcycle if you consider the 34.4 inch seat height. Um, I am six foot two, and as we pull up to this red light here, you can see that I am, I can sort of barely flat foot, essentially. Um, my leg's pretty straight. It's a, it's a sizable reach to the ground, I would say. Comfortable enough for me, but if you're under six feet, it might be a different story. Something to keep in mind with the weight as well is that it is 517 pounds with all that stuff that I mentioned, right? The crash bar, skid plate, um, radiator guard, hand guards, blah, blah, blah. So the weight of a stock bike will be a little bit less than that, um, but still a, still a 500 pound bike, which is, uh, you know, not nothing. But to try to translate that into a discussion about ergonomics, the bike's just kind of big in general. It's got a 63 inch wheelbase, <laughs> which is a long wheelbase. And it's got a seat that's almost 35 inches off the ground and it weighs 500 pounds. It's a fairly large motorcycle. And for someone my size, six foot two, I actually think it fits me perfectly. Terrific, it's awesome. I really like the wide handlebar. There's uh, some room to move around on the seat forward to back, which we'll talk a little bit more about on the highway here. It just sort of leaves me comfortable. I like the reach to the bar. I like the amount of leg room. It's, it's great. It works really well for me. If you're five foot six instead of six foot two, it might not be quite as fit like a glove, <laughs> if you will. There is, I should mention, a low seat option from Ducati. And I think that brings the seat down to 34.1 inches, if memory serves. And then uh, a suspension adjustment, a, a sort of like lowering link maybe, that you can get from Ducati that uh, brings the seat down to 33.3 inches, I believe. So there are some measures you can take to make the bike lower but it's still just a big tall bike gloomy day in the skies gloomy day for traffic on the freeway as well but that won't keep me from telling you that the comfort that i feel when i sit on the bike for a basic ergonomic standpoint continues on the open road i think it's a pretty nice place to spend time i wasn't expecting the seat to be as comfortable as it is i'm not saying it's perfect and maybe part of it was expectations, but I just kind of thought it was going to be, I don't know, a little more raw, but it's pretty comfy. And same goes for the aerodynamics, actually. I, you know, these kind of flat forward facing Dakar style windscreens that are becoming more popular lately, non-adjustable by the way, they often put sort of form before function and I wasn't expecting the wind protection to be I don't know, as kind of like calm and comprehensive as it is, but it's actually not bad for me. I did see a couple of comments on my Instagram feed of people under six feet tall saying that the buffeting was quite bad for them with this windscreen. So your results may vary, but I was uh, relatively impressed. All right, now we're going highway speeds here, 70, 75 miles an hour. And one thing that I noticed a little bit and other testers in-house here at Revzilla West noticed was that the vibes from the engine are a little more significant than we were expecting, perhaps. Put a passenger on the back, the passenger said the same thing. And um, that's kind of neither here nor there, except that I also got some feedback on social media about the crash bars here, these aftermarket crash bars we talked about causing a different dynamic in the vibration of the bike when installed, and that some owners have been frustrated and found that the crash bars increase vibes to the handlebars to the seat etc and i think that that's worth noting because well it's secondhand information i'm not telling you that it's a fact but it is an interesting note to keep in mind with aftermarket parts on a bike that it can change the dynamic of how the bike deals with that kind of thing like engine vibes to the to the seat and handlebar something to think about i didn't think it was that bad i would still crush miles on this bike but there have been more than a few complaints rolling around the desert x owners and testers community for what it's worth. And of course, you get all the sort of Ducati features along with the somewhat elevated price tag, one of which being cruise control, so we can set that just for the heck of it. Uh, heated grips, which I'm gonna turn on also, just because I can. 
and that 5.4 gallon gas tank I returned some gas figures in the low 40s something like that so you're gonna go more than 200 miles on a tank theoretically I mean practically really it's a legitimate travel adventure machine last but not least everybody we got to talk about mirrors of course and uh, I like these ones they're good nice sturdy stalks simple enough round face round mirrors are always gonna be a little bit of a compromise because they don't have uh, quite as wide a swath to show what's behind you but there's a cost to style everybody am I right All right so off into the neighborhood and some slow speed testing on this bike that I have already mentioned is tall and relatively heavy and relatively long. First stop sign test, woo hoo hoo, that was clean everybody. Uh, I often don't do a lot of stop sign tests for what's worth before I actually do this the daily ride test. Cause I think I like to be surprised also, to be honest. <laughs> so the uh, first one went pretty well. And I think in general, the controls of the Desert X are direct and premium as you would expect. The clutch has good feel, The engine sort of talks to you. I will say I don't love the fueling. Um, it's not that it's bad, it's just always a little bit, it's kind of quirky. Ducati fueling has a has a, a feel that takes some getting used to and considering there are a bunch of different throttle maps which we'll have time to talk about, it can be uh, it can be extra difficult to adapt to depending how often you switch modes. Fudge that one up. But in general, I found uh, around town the same thing I found riding this bike off-road, which again, we will address a little bit more later, which is that the engine is surprisingly tractable and usable at uh, really low RPM. So we'll slow down here to 2000 RPM, second gear, roll the throttle on. Not a lot of shimmies and shakes, it just sort of works. And um, you might expect a Ducati engine to be high strung. Uh, and this one does have a little bit of sort of a uh, peaky personality, but if you think about it, same engine from the Multistrada V2, from the Hyper Motard, from the Monster. So it makes sense, I think, that it would be refined within an inch of its life um, because it's using all those different models and uh, not just models, but important models for a Ducati. So yeah, Ooh. that's that one up. Not, not, certainly not a perfect showing in Stop Sign Challenge. Right, approaching this here stoplight, which often takes a dog's age. So perhaps we can talk about this five inch TFT and some of the ride modes, which I think you get to by holding this down. Is that right? Yeah. So you got touring, urban, sport, rally, enduro, wet. So many different options. Uh, and you can see down here, it'll give you a breakdown of exactly what changes in the mode, right? So wet is uh, medium power, wheelie control four, traction control eight, uh, ABS three, engine brake two. And all those modes change, or all those settings change as you go through each mode. And I suppose we're in an urban setting, so I can select urban. That would make sense, right? Uh, and the neat thing about Ducati modes, I think, is that there is no customizable rider mode, but each and every one of those modes is customizable. So if you want to go in and turn urban into, uh, you know, high power map and no traction control, and then you can do that if you want to. And then urban mode becomes your own personal definition of urban, um, which I think I appreciate. I uh, kind of like that. Why not? Okie dokie, lover's lane. I do have a passenger report, but because I have cruise control, I can <laughs> do the, the new standard in daily rider passenger testing, which is that we get back there right now. Uh, lots of legroom, lots and lots of legroom. Uh, the passenger report I got was that the seat was pretty good, by gosh, and I think I would agree. It's surprisingly wide and um, it's not ultra cushy, but it's not too bad. The only thing I would say about it is that it's fairly flat from the rider seat back to the passenger seat. So if the passenger is much shorter than the rider, for example. They might have trouble seeing over, more looking around the helmet or looking over the shoulder. But aside from that, surprising amount of legroom and decent padding, which is good because in some ways the Desert X is a styling exercise, but in other ways it's a legitimate stab at true adventure. And, um, you know, I think true adventure bikes need to have 
true uh, passenger accommodations. All right, into the twisty road section. And this is an area where I feel like a lot of people were really impressed by the Desert X that, oh, it's got that Ducati sport bike pedigree, prowess, whatever. Um, and it really feels good. And you going through a set of curves, it's such an impressive uh, sport touring bike considering the 21 inch front wheel and blah, blah, blah. But I feel like here on Daily Rider, we have often said about an Africa Twin or a Tenere 700 or uh, other 21 inch front wheel adventure bikes that, hey, you know, these bikes aren't that bad, really. If you just sort of uh, approach a twisty set of pavement with the right mindset, they work really well. And I'd say the Desert X fits into that absolutely. And it is, to a certain extent, surprising considering how uh, the bike looks, that it works so well on a twisty road. But I think the thing that sets this bike apart is the sort of crackle of life that the engine has when you rev it up. Again, Monster is a hyper motard engine, essentially. It's got that, um, it's got that little pizzazz Ducati performance thing and a quick shifter up and down, which makes you feel sporty and uh, good brakes. But in general, I wouldn't expect this bike to feel hugely capable on pavement compared to other bikes in the class. I think, just like we've been saying here on DR, they're just, uh, underrated and the expectations are low for bikes like this when they shouldn't be. I also think, and I've mentioned this before, maybe even with the Tenere 700, come to think of it, that the tires that you have on a bike like this make a big difference, right? Uh, so if you put street oriented tires on, you're going to feel like, wow, pretty good. And if you want to rage off road, you're going to have some knobby stuff on there and the handling on roads like this might deteriorate a little bit, which is something to keep in mind. All right, I've had enough with for urban mode, I want to go, what do I want to do? <laughs> sport, I'm turning to sport. I should have put it in sport before we did the sporty road there, huh? That was stupid. So many modes, so little time, am I right? Now we're going, now we'll go to sport. See, see if we're feeling sporty. <laughs> yep. Definitely puts a little more emphasis on the uh, initial roll of the throttle so it feels like the bike's a little punchier. Um, and I actually don't actually know what all the settings do in those in sport mode. Where are you at here? Wheelie control two, traction control five, ABS three, still pretty conservative, I'd say. But it's nice you can uh, change the modes on the fly. I like that too. Oh, yellow light. So we can talk about brakes. Let's do it. And uh, the brakes on the Desert X are quite, quite good. Typical. Ducati thing to do, put big beefy Brembo calipers up there and nice master cylinder uh, braided lines, whoop. Uh, and uh, yeah, they feel they feel sharp. I especially like the ABS off-road for what it's worth, just in case I forget to mention it. There's this little wrap jump here that we hit sometimes when we're on ATV bikes, right? Let's do it. <laughs> uh, it's the kind of stuff a 21 inch front wheel adventure bike ease for lunch. Breakfast, brunch, whatever time of day it is. On the topic of suspension, if you read my lovely colleague Spurgeon's first ride article on Common Tread, for which the link is in the description of this video, please do check it out. You will know that he complained about the suspension a little bit, as he often does about suspension. <laughs> but to his credit, other people complained about the suspension too. Thought that it was a little bit out of balance and maybe not quite good enough for a bike that practically cost 20 grand. And I, I, I can kind of see where those people are coming from, but in general, I I think the suspension is not bad. I, I mean, I, I rode it on a dirt road, I took it over water bars, I jumped it, slammed it into things, rode on some single track. I don't know, it seemed okay, if I'm being honest. Um, so I don't mean to undercut what, um, what other folks had to say about it, not saying they're wrong, um, but, uh, but if, if it's a little bit underwhelming for the, for the price of the bike, I still found it perfectly usable, practically, and it's fully adjustable. Alrighty, one more red light, which we should probably use to talk about that uh, dash just a little bit more. We talked through some of the ride modes. There isn't a whole lot more to say, except that a lot of information packed in. You can see there's still a haze of dust on there. I'm not sure how that's looking on the camera, but it does, in bright sunlight, cloud the screen a little bit, and of course the bike's made to get dusty, so it's... I don't know, not annoying, but uh, notable, perhaps, that the nice glossy sheen on the dash 
those pickup dust to make it a little bit harder to see sometimes. Tons of information on the dash here though, which is nice. And you can scroll down to these data points at the bottom, trip one, trip two, all that kind of data. And then if you hold the upper button, it jumps up to these uh, setting menu here. And then of course, if you jump into the setting menu, you can adjust all the stuff that you expect. Daytime running late, the display setup, uh, you know, auto cancel signals, language units, blah, blah, blah. That's all administrative stuff, not that interesting, right? But uh, good, uh, good comprehensive dash setup in general. And uh, I like the vertical thing, right? Uh, anybody with me? I think it's good. Gives it, uh, gives it kind of a rally feel. Tenere 700 Africa Twin kind of, kind of feel, which is nice, I think. So, we're uh, approaching the end of the daily ride and um, sort of said we were going to answer that one question, uh, if nothing else, which is how does the Ducati street performance pedigree translate to um, a 21 inch front wheel adventure bike? Did, does it work? I think so. I don't know. I, I feel like my opinion about this bike is different than some of my colleagues at Revzilla who uh, were a little bit underwhelmed by uh, some of the aspects of it. I think that it's very big and it's pretty expensive, but aside from that, a solid machine. It's cool. I like it. All right. Speaking of 21 inch front wheels, shall we take a little dirt road shortcut, everybody? So it's kind of a fun aspect of this bike when you run it into rally mode you could do enduro now well, it's just rally you got like this roll chart thing and the speedo gets smaller and you got like a huge range thing that tells you how much range you got and then all the the settings of course change so what do we got here full power wheelie control off traction control on one which is right on where i wanted to talk about because i like the off-road traction control well let's experiment with it shall we <laughs> yeah, we're raging. We're raging down this road. And like I said, I like the ABS too. Just hoss on it. Feels like it works well. Solid. It does look like they graded this area, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, and they graded our jump. Son of a gun. I'm gonna have to uh, come back and rebuild it or something. You guys, this is a big day. In, in Daily Rider folklore, the day the jump disappeared. Oh, son of a gun. <laughs> These big donuts I'm doing though, and that's uh, with traction control in level one, which I appreciate. I think it works well. I like it. I'm gonna go look for another jump. It looks like they graded all this out too. What are we gonna do? Am I gonna have to come out here with a shovel? All right, well, let's, let's whip it around. Rear ABS is off. While we're traipsing down this little road here, I will say there's also enduro mode, which offers a similar view from the dash, less power in the throttle map, slightly more conservative electronics. And I actually like this mode a lot when I rode off-road. 110 claimed horsepower, remember, so dumbing down the power a little bit when you're on like loose gravel that kind of thing i actually thought it was pretty good i i had fun in that mode and if you really want to cut loose and rage then rally mode's a good one but i liked enduro mode i thought it was good all right <clears throat> we're gonna go back to sport mode and we're gonna try wheelie i actually haven't i haven't done this yet on this bike <laughs> Huge long wheelbase though, so I'm a. I guess you could say I'm a little nervous. Let's go second gear. Uh, huh. There we go. Yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> oh boy, that wheelie went um, went way north. Yeehaw. Sport mode. I also shut off rear ABS because that's a thing you can do, which means you can back it in. Woo -hoo -hoo, got real swayzy there. I scared the bejesus out of that uh, truck driver. Sorry, buddy. But that's uh, it's something I appreciate about um, Ducati Electronics in general, that uh, you can 
adjust that stuff. Middle, so sport mode right now is like my hooligan mode, right? I got uh, wheelie control off, I got rear ABS off, and then if it starts raining or I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm taking it easy now, I just hold this down and I plunk it into urban or touring or whatever, and uh, I'm back to my um, more conservative, more reasonable, more responsible, perhaps, riding mode. But for now, I'm gonna put it back to sport because you never know if there's more backing in to be done, am I right? Here we go, obvious entrance. <laughs> that was a juicy one, everybody. <laughs> oh my god, that's really, really quite fun. <laughs> Look at all the parking spaces we have to do a U-turn challenge today. How about it? All right, let's do it. I think we're going to do okay. Steering lock seems good on this bike, although it is long, as I said. So just about on the side, full lock, no feet down. Eh, what do we got there? 1.7, 1.8 parking spaces. That's not bad. Anything under two, I think, is decent. Well, I really hope that I talked about all the things you wanted me to talk about on this daily ride. And if I didn't, of course, remember we're about to answer Instagram questions where you, the viewer, um, you can ask your own questions. So stick around. Let's listen to this uh, $2,000 Termignoni muffler, shall we? <sighs> See how it sounds. I mean, for a street legal pipe, uh, our street legal pipes, I should say, are, are usually pretty quiet and tame, and this one is fairly quiet and tame, but, you know, it doesn't sound like anything else in the class. I appreciate that, I suppose. All right, first question is from Johnny Kilmore, who asks, you usually cover stuff I'm interested in, thank you, Johnny, but if you can comment on luggage options, that'd be great, since the bike is new and won't have a lot of aftermarket options right out of the gate. So, there are a whole bunch of packs that come, that you can get for the Desert X, like a rally pack with a, with like a single piece seed, and you can get the 2.1 gallon auxiliary fuel tank thingamabobber that goes here and like bolsters your fuel range, and among all the mumbo jumbo you can get are aluminum side panniers, like hard, hard aluminum panniers. I believe there's a big rack that goes here. Uh, so it, it, it takes a, a whole separate rack that goes around the rear of the bike and then the panniers mount to that. It seems like a good option for luggage, but is a fairly significant amount of hardware that goes on there. And they're not cheap. I think the, the, that pack, that uh, I don't know, travel package, or if I forget what it's called, is 2,500 bucks or something like that. Um, so... Uh, not cheap, but a good option. Aluminum top loaders are sort of the, the, the bee's knees, in my opinion. That being said, you can, of course, you know, sling some soft bags over the back, some universal ones, and do that thing if you would like as well. Hope that helps. Next question is from V Volts, who asks, it costs as much as a 1250 GSA from BMW or a Harley Pan America. Why would you prefer this one over those? Uh, so I don't know if it costs quite as much as a GSA, uh, adventure. Well, it doesn't matter. The point is, yeah, you're right. It's it's 22. This bike, as it sits, 22,000 bucks, basically. And it's, that's, a, that's a spicy meatball, which we'll come back to. First of all, it's stature, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a unique looking bike. It's cool. The 21 inch front wheel is more, I don't know, it sort of has its chest puffed out when it comes to off-road stuff. And I think it's genuinely, you know, a little bit more rugged than certainly a, a Pan America, you know, like it's got more suspension travel and it's just sort of like taller and more robust. So that's one reason to choose it. As far as like, why would I choose it for a sport touring option? I don't know that I would. And I don't think that Ducati has a lot of ground to stand on it being the same price as a, as a 1250GS <laughs> when it comes to a sport touring option. But it is different. And if you want it to be different than those bikes, it's worth getting, I think. Thomas Izzo has the next question, and it's a question I really like. How does it compare to the Triumph Scrambler 1200XE? Is it a better overall motorcycle? Which one do you prefer? Thanks. So I like that comparison a lot because the, the Scrambler 1200XE from Triumph is a long, tall, heavy, big, burly, retro-looking, badass, adventurish kind of bike. It's a Scrambler, sure, but it's really kind of a big adventure bike considering how how large it is and how capable it is of slamming down a, a dirt road 
as for which one I prefer, I think the Desert X is a little bit more versatile. Like I like the wind protection and I think that, uh, yeah, more versatile. <laughs> and I think that that's worth something. But I do think when it comes to outright looks, it's a dead heat. And I can't tell you which one to get, obviously, but I think they're both really, really handsome bikes. The Triumph might be just that titch better looking. It's got the pipes that run up the side. It's just a, it's gorgeous in my opinion. This is a handsome machine too, but I like that comparison a lot. And I think that's something that other people should consider as well. Like, why do you like this bike and why, what are the attributes that it has that might have, uh, that other bikes might have that you also um, might want to cross shop. So good question. And um, if it were me, I don't know. I think I'd get the one with the wind protection. I just, I like a, I like a fairing. I'm a practical guy. What can I say? Next question is from Rubber and Metal who asks, I want an adventure looking bike for mainly daily commutes, like how some people daily drive their rugged SUV in a city. Will this bike be okay for posers like me? Wow. Psychological warfare here from Rubber and Metal. So, um, I think, uh, Yes, it will be just fine for posers like uh, yourself, Rubber and Metal, or anyone else who wants to take that route. I think as we saw riding around the city, it works pretty well, right? It was good in the neighborhood, decent at the stop sign challenge, pretty good for U-turns. You can shut off rear ABS and you can hack it into your driveway if you want to. I think it's great for that. It's just tall. And if you're not tall, you might find it a pain in the tail to ride around mainly for daily commutes. And I'm not sure if the looks are quite worth it, but that's for you to decide, all you daily rider posers and viewers. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Last question is from Lowly Afi Billy, who asks, on a scale from Ikea to Sicilian, exactly how spicy is this meatball? I don't know enough about meatballs, if I'm being perfectly honest, to, to, to use a really good analogy. <laughs> um, but I think the, the, what I'm reaching for here, and the reason I saved this question is that it's a little bit spicier than you might expect. It might be that, that meatball that you have over at your friend's place. And they say, we're having spaghetti meatballs. And you think, oh, that's fine. Uh, that's great. I love spaghetti meatballs. That's easy enough. And then you start eating the meal and you're like, huh, wow, this has got, <clears throat> this has got some kick. And then you're at your friend's house, so you don't want to like, you're drinking a little bit more water than you thought. And you're like, oh, I don't really want to complain about how spicy the meatballs are. Cause then it's like, mom's going to think I'm a pansy. But deep down, you're kind of like, whew, this is a, uh, maybe a little bit more than I was expecting to get from this meatball. So that's my, my meatball analogy. And uh, as you can tell, I, I like this bike more than I, than I was expecting to. I think in part because my colleagues who rode it before me didn't really like it. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's because it fits me. Maybe it's because I'm vain and I'm a city poser and I like the, the round headlights. But, um, but I had a great time on the daily ride and I think many more people will on a Desert X. So yeah. That's my review. Stick around, everybody. We're going to put the sucker on the Daily Rider leaderboard, and then I'll let you go, I promise. All right, everybody, here we are inside RevZilla West, and we are at the Daily Rider leaderboard. We've got the Ducati Desert X in the hopper ready to go on the board. It does get a dollar sign. Now, typically, as you know, the dollar sign is reserved usually for $20,000 plus bikes, and technically, the Desert X starts at $17,100, something like that. For a mid sized bike, it is quite. Uh, pricey so i think it's fair that it gets the uh, that it gets the dollar sign on there any bike with a with a price tag that high i think it's it's only fair to to denote it but as i said i do like it so where it falls on the daily rider leaderboard i think it's going to be kind of interesting aprilia touareg 660 that's a bike we didn't really talk about in the questions and maybe should have it is comparable to the desert x uh, desert x is quite a bit heavier than that bike about 50 60 pounds heavier um according to the Daily Rider scales, and that's significant, right? I think the, the Aprilia Touareg is a, is a little bit more agile, um, simpler, smaller, more precise kind of off-road weapon. But, you know, I, you know, so some people will say like, well, why would you get a Desert X when you get a Touareg? Because, you know, it's like cheaper. And sure, it is cheaper. The Desert X does, you know, have a more advanced uh, suite of electronics and it, and it feels more premium. It feels kind of burlier and, um, and stronger. So I think that, that that's fair. The, the price gap, that's up to you to determine whether or not you hate it. But uh, those are my thoughts there. Triumph Tiger Sport 660, much cheaper than a Desert X. Um, not quite as versatile, but more approachable, easier to, to sort of <coughs> approach. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so it's hard. I think I would recommend a Tiger Sport 660 more often than I would recommend a Desert X. But, but push comes to shove, I, I, I like the Desert X's 
gusto and, and personality and versatility. So I think it's going to be up here. I think that the Harley Davidson Pan America is a more, more approachable bike from a seat height perspective and it has all the same bells and whistles realistically um, on the spec sheet as a Desert X. But I like the Desert X better. I just, I just like it better and it is tall and long and, and heavy and, and it's a little bit uncompromising in some ways. But sitting next to each other in the garage, I'm taking the Desert X. I, I, I like it. Uh, and I'm putting the Suzuki Gixxus 1000 GT Plus above the Desert X uh, because it's just too good. That Suzuki is just too good. Uh, not as versatile as the Desert X, of course, you're not going to ride it off-road, but, but, but price-wise, capability-wise, power, luggage, that bike was just great, I thought. So there you go. A podium finish for the Desert X, um, which I think surprises me and is maybe going to surprise some other folks as well. I, I, I just, uh, ultimately, like I said, um, it's big and heavy and expensive, but aside from that, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about it. So uh, there you have it. Yet another daily ride in the books, as usual. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned a thing or two, and I very much hope to see you next time on Daily Rider. See you, everybody. All right, approaching yet another stop light. Let's, um, let's take a quick look. Uh, no, we're not gonna have time, actually. The sky light's gonna go green. Just kidding, just kidding. We can cut that part.